how came they there? The room was handsomely furnished, but such as I would quarrel with none for calling common, for it certainly was uninteresting. Not a thing in it had to do with genuine individual choice, but merely with the fashion and custom of the class to which its occupiers belonged. It was a dining room, of good size, appointed with all the things a dining room ought to have, mostly new and entirely expensive, mirrored sideboard and oak, heavy chairs, just the dozen, in fawn-colored Morocco seats and backs. The dining room, in short, of a London house inhabited by rich, middle-class people. A big fire blazed in the low, round-backed grate, whose flashes were reflected in the steel fender and the ugly fire irons that were never used. A snowy cloth of linen, finer than ordinary, for there was pride in the housekeeping, covered the large dining table, and a company, evidently a family, was eating its breakfast. But how came these people there? For, supposing my reader one of the company, let him rise from the well-appointed table, its silver, bright as the complex motions of a butler's elbows can make it, its china ornate, though not elegant, its ham huge, and neither too fat nor too lean, its game pie, with nothing to be desired in composition, or in flavor, natural or artificial. Let him rise from these, and go to the left of the two windows, for there are two opposite each other, the room having been enlarged by being built out. If he be such a one as I would have for a reader, might I choose, a reader whose heart, not merely his eye, mirrors what he sees, one who not merely beholds the outward shows of things, but catches a glimpse of the soul that looks out of them, whose garment and revelation they are. If he be such, I say, he will stand, for more than a moment, speechless with something akin to that which made the morning stars sing together. He finds himself gazing far over western seas, while yet the sun is in the east. They lie clear and cold, pale and cold, broken with islands scattering thinner to the horizon, which is jagged here and there with yet another. The ocean looks a wild yet peaceful mingling of lake and land. Some of the islands are green from shore to shore, of low yet broken surface. Others are mere rocks with bold front to the sea, one or two of them strange both in form and character. Over the pale blue sea hangs the pale blue sky, flecked with a few cold white clouds that look as if they had disowned the earth they had got so high, though nonetheless her children and doomed to descend again to her bosom. A keen little wind is out, crisping the surface of the sea in patches, a pretty large crisping to be seen from that height, for the window looks over hill above hill to the sea. Life, quiet yet eager, is all about. The solitude itself is alive, content to be a solitude because it is alive. Its life needs nothing from beyond, is independent even of the few sails of fishing boats that here and there, with their red-brown, break the blue of the water. If my reader, gently obedient to my thaumaturgy, will now turn and cross to the other window, let him as he does so beware of casting a glance on his right towards the place he has left at the table, for the room will now look to him tenfold commonplace, so that he too will be inclined to ask, how came these and their belongings here, just here? Let him first look from the window. There he sees hills of heather, rolling away eastward at middle distance, beginning to rise into mountains, and further yet, on the horizon, showing snow on their crests, though that may disappear and return several times before settling down for the winter. It is a solemn and very still region, not a pretty country at all, but great, beautiful with the beauties of color and variety of surface, while far in the distance, where the mountains and the clouds have business together, its aspect rises to grandeur. To his first glance, probably not a tree will be discoverable. The second will fall upon a solitary clump of firs, like a mole on the cheek of one of the hills not far off, a hill steeper than most of them, and green to the top. Is my reader seized with that form of divine longing which wonders what lies over the nearest hill? Does he fancy, ascending the other side to its crest, some sweet face of highland girl, singing songs of the old centuries, while yet there was a people in these wastes? Why should he imagine in the presence of the actual? Why dream when the eyes can see? 
he has but to return to the table to reseat himself by the side of one of the prettiest of girls. She is fair, yet with a glowing tinge under her fairness which flames out only in her eyes and seldom reddens her skin. She has brown hair with just a suspicion of red and no more, and a waviness that turns to curl at the ends. She has a good forehead, arched a little, not without a look of habitation, though whence that comes it might be hard to say. There are no great clouds on that sky of the face, but there is a soft dimness that might turn to rain. She has a straight nose, not too large for the imperfect yet decidedly Greek contour, a doubtful, rather straight, thin-lipped mouth, which seems to dissolve into a bewitching smile, and reveals perfect teeth, and a good deal more to the eyes that can read it. When the mouth smiles, the eyes light up, which is a good sign. Their shape is long oval, and their color, when unlighted, much that of an unpeeled almond. When she smiles, they grow red. She has an object in life which can hardly be called a mission. She is rather tall and quite graceful, though not altogether natural in her movements. Her dress gives a feathery impression to one who rather receives than notes the look of ladies. She has a good hand, not the doll hand so much admired of those who can judge only of quantity and know nothing of quality, but a fine, sensible hand, the best thing about her. A hand may be too small just as well as too large. Poor Mother Earth! What a load of disappointing women, made fit for fine things, and running all to self and show, she carries on her weary old back. From all such, good Lord, deliver us, except it be for our discipline, or their awakening. Near her at the breakfast table sits one of aspect so different that you could ill believe they belonged to the same family. She is younger and taller, tall indeed, but not ungraceful, though by no means beautiful. She has all the features that belong to a face, among them not a good one. Stay, I am wrong. There were, in truth, dominant over the rest, two good features. Her two eyes, dark as eyes well could be without being all pupil, large and rather long like her sister's until she looked at you, and then they opened wide. They did not flash or glow, but were full of the light that tries to see, questioning eyes. They were simple eyes, I will not say without arrière-pensée, for there was no end of thinking faculty, if not yet thought, behind them, but honest eyes that looked at you from the root of eyes, with neither attack nor defense in them. If she was not so graceful as her sister, she was hardly more than a girl, and had a remnant of that curiously lovely mingling of grace and clumsiness which we see in long-legged growing girls. I will give her the advantage of not being further described, except so far as this, that her hair was long and black, that her complexion was dark with something of a freckly unevenness, and that her hands were larger and yet better than her sister's. There is one truth about a plain face that may not have occurred to many. Its ugliness accompanies a condition of larger undevelopment. For all ugliness that is not evil is undevelopment and so implies the larger material and possibility of development. The idea of no countenance is yet carried out, and this kind will take more developing for the completion of its idea, and may result in a greater beauty. I would therefore advise any young man of aspiration in the matter of beauty to choose a plain woman for wife, if through her plainness she is yet lovely in his eyes, for the loveliness is herself victorious over the plainness, and her face, so far from complete and yet serving her loveliness, has room in it for completion on a grander scale than possibly most handsome faces. In a handsome face one sees the lines of its coming perfection, and has a glimpse of what it might be when finished. Few are prophets enough for a plain face. A keen surprise of beauty waits many a man if he be pure enough to come near the transfiguration of the homely face he loved. This plain face was a solemn one, and the solemnity suited the plainness. It was not specially expressive, did not look specially intelligent. There was more of latent than operative power in it, while her sisters had more expression than power. Both were ladylike. Whether they were ladies, my reader may determine. There are common ladies, and there are rare ladies. The former may be countesses, the latter may be peasants. There were two younger girls at the table, of whom I will say nothing more than that one of them looked awkward, promised to be handsome, and was apparently a good soul. 
The other was pretty and looked pert. The family possessed two young men, but they were not here. One was a partner in the business from which his father had practically retired. The other was that day expected from Oxford. The mother, a woman with many autumnal reminders of spring about her, sat at the head of the table and regarded her queendom with a smile a little set, perhaps, but bright. She had the look of a woman on good terms with her motherhood, with society, with the universe, yet had scarce a shadow of assumption on her countenance. For if she felt as one who had a claim upon things to go pleasantly with her, had she not put in her claim, and had it acknowledged? Her smile was a sweet, white-toothed smile, true if shallow, and a more than tolerably happy one, often irradiating the governor opposite, for so was the head styled by the whole family from mother to chit. He was the only one at the table on whose countenance a shadow, as of some end unattained, was visible. He had tried to get into Parliament, and had not succeeded, but I will not presume to say that was the source of the shadow. He did not look discontented or even peevish. There was indeed a certain radiance of success about him. Only above the cloudy horizon of his thick, dark eyebrows seemed to hang a thundery atmosphere. His forehead was large, but his features rather small. He had, however, grown a trifle fat, which tended to make up. In his youth he must have been very nice looking, probably too pretty to be handsome. In good health, and when things went well, as they had mostly done with him, he was sweet-tempered. What he might be in other conditions was seldom conjectured. But was that a sleeping thundercloud, or only the shadow of his eyebrows? He had a good opinion of himself, on what grounds I do not know, but he was rich, and I know no better ground. I doubt if there is any more certain soil for growing a good opinion of oneself. Certainly, the more you try to raise one by doing what is right and worth doing, the less you succeed. Mr. Peregrine Palmer had finished his breakfast, and sat for a while looking at nothing in particular, plunged in deep thought about nothing at all, while the girls went on with theirs. He was a little above the middle height, and looked not much older than his wife. His black hair had but begun to be touched with silver. He seemed a man without an atom of care more than humanity counts reasonable. His speech was not unlike that of an Englishman, for although born in Glasgow, he had been to Oxford. He spoke respectfully to his wife, and with a pleasant playfulness to his daughters. His manner was no wise made to order, but natural enough. His grammar was as good as conversation requires. Everything was respectable about him, and yet he was one remove, at least, from a gentleman. Something hard to define was lacking in that idea of perfection. Mr. Peregrine Palmer's grandfather had begun to make the family fortune by developing a little secret still in a remote highland glen which had acquired a reputation for its whiskey into a great superterrene distillery. Both he and his son made money by it, and it had done well for Mr. Peregrine also. With all three of them, the making of money had been the great calling of life. They were diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving mammon, and founding claim to consideration on the fact. Neither Jacob nor John Palmer's worst enemy had ever called him a hypocrite. Neither had been suspected of thinking to serve mammon and God. Both had gone regularly to church, but neither had taught in Sunday school, or once gone to a weekday sermon. Peregrine had built a church and a school. He did not now take any active part in the distillery, but worked mainly in money itself. Jacob, the son of a ship chandler in Greenock, had never thought about gentlemen or no gentlemen, but his son John had entertained the difference and done his best to make a gentleman of Peregrine, and neither Peregrine nor any of his family ever doubted his father's success, and if he had not quite succeeded, I would have the blame laid on Peregrine, and not on either father or grandfather. For a man to grow a gentleman, it is of great consequence that his grandfather should have been an honest man. But if a man be a gentleman, it matters little what his grandfather or grandmother either was. Nay, if a man be a gentleman, it is of the smallest consequence, except for its own sake, whether the world counts him one or not. Mr. Peregrine Palmer rose from the table with a merry remark on the prolongation of the meal by his girls, and went towards the door. "'Are you going to shoot?' asked his wife. "'Not today.' "'But I am going to look after my guns. 
I dare say they've got them all right, but there's nothing like seeing to a thing yourself. Mr. Palmer had this virtue, and this very gentlemanlike way, that he always gave his wife as full an answer as he would another lady. He was not given to marital brevity. He was there for the grouse shooting. Not exactly, only as it were. He did not care very much about the sport, and had he cared nothing, would have been there all the same. Other people, in what he counted his social position, shot grouse, and he liked to do what other people did, for then he felt all right. If ever he tried the gate of heaven, it would be because other people did. But the primary cause of his being so far in the north was the simple fact that he had had the chance of buying a property very cheap. A fine property of mist and cloud, heather and rock, mountain and moor, and with no such reputation for grouse as to enhance its price. My estate sounded well, and after a time of good preserving he would be able to let it well, he trusted. No sooner was it bought than his wife and daughters were eager to visit it, and the man of business, perceiving it would cost him much less if they passed their autumns there instead of on the continent, proceeded at once to enlarge the house and make it comfortable. If they should never go a second time, it would, with its perfect appointments, make the shooting there more attractive. They had arrived the day before. The journey had been fatiguing, for a great part of it was by road, but they were all in splendid health, and not too tired to get up at a reasonable hour the next day. 